Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the only show on the internet that thinks D&D should stand for dragons and dragons. This week, we're talking about dragons. By popular demand, I am here to talk about our final entry in the Forgotten Chromatic Dragons series of videos, the Orange Dragon. These draconic creatures are pretty weird in a lot of ways which I am very excited to get into. So as always, my goal today is to go over the Orange Dragon's lore, ecology, and dive into just exactly what makes them so unique when compared to other dragons in D&D. We're also going to talk about some plot hooks and adventure ideas that might involve an orange dragon, and as always convert this creature from AD&D into 5th edition D&D with some shiny new stats. I also do just want to give a quick disclaimer here, while this video is entirely dedicated to talking about orange dragons, my first video in this series about the yellow dragon goes over a lot of the lore pertaining to yellow, purple, and orange dragons kind of in a general sense. So in the interest of not just repeating everything I already covered in that video, instead I'll leave a link to both the yellow and purple dragon videos in the pinned comment on this video, so if you want to check out either of those videos first before you watch this one, feel free. But for those of you who already saw those videos or don't care and just want to learn about our orange scaly boys here, Stay right where you are, because orange isn't just the best flavor of soda, it's also the color of an explosive, draconic tyrant. The orange dragon first appeared alongside the yellow and purple dragons in issue number 65 of the aptly named Dragon Magazine. Following in the footsteps of the other dragons in this issue, they were created by two various chromatic dragons getting busy, in this case red and yellow dragons. Man, I never thought I'd have to make so many videos about dragons f***ing, but here we are. As the children of two very distinct draconic bloodlines, they have a pretty fascinating profile and general list of traits. From their red ancestors, they inherit a ferocious will and unbridled brutality. However, from their yellow ancestors, they inherit both a calculating demeanor and a nearly infinite amount of patience. The end result is a dragon who is entirely unpredictable. Depending on how an orange dragon feels on any given day, they are just as likely to charge head first into combat as they are to meticulously lure their enemy into a trap. Usually they will opt for whichever option is most tactically advantageous, but they are still very hard to predict even with that in mind. What's going on with you? What are you talking about? You, you sound insane. Like their red dragon ancestors, they are imperious and conceited, but they also have the forethought and understanding to recognize the only way they stay on top is by knowing when to unleash that ferocity and when to hide. Like other hybrid dragons, their breath weapon is also a combination of both parents. As we know from my yellow dragon video, which we all totally watched, they breathe highly condensed salt. And as we know from every dragon in pop culture ever, red dragons breathe fire. So what do you think the orange dragon's breath weapon is? I mean, if we just combine the two directly, we might end up with flaming salt. And while flaming salt might make for an interesting encounter, the orange dragon's true breath weapon is, in my opinion, much more inspired. They breathe a line of pure Sodium. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, isn't that the same as the yellow dragon except it's in a line instead of a cone? And while common rock salt might often be referred to as sodium, it's actually sodium chloride. That might not seem like a huge difference, but let's just say if you remove the chloride from the equation, it's not something you'd want to eat. Before we go any further, I just want to say that this attack is definitely one of the most unique draconic breath weapons that I've ever come across. And I'm sure that all the scientists and people who didn't fail high school chemistry like I did that are watching right now know where I'm going with this. Sodium in its purest form is extremely flammable when exposed to the air, especially when the air has a lot of moisture in it. So when the orange dragon attacks and coats a group of adventurers in its sodium spray, 
for a few seconds, it might seem like nothing really happened, but once the sodium starts to react with the air, it will react by bursting into flames. This slightly delayed reaction is pretty interesting and not something we see a lot in D&D, but what's even more interesting is the other way that sodium can react violently. When sodium is exposed to water, this happens. When sodium is exposed to water, it explodes violently. So the orange dragon can not only breathe a delayed burst of fire, but if it targets somebody who's soaking wet or an area that has water in it, things are gonna start blowing up. The concept of a dragon that can essentially breathe explosives is not only hilarious to me, but it's fucking awesome. God, I'm gonna use so many explosion effects in this video. And this explosive trait behind the orange dragon's breath weapon heavily informs its choice of habitat. I feel like it goes without saying that they tend to make their homes in places that are damp with lots of water present. Ideally, they'll want to settle in a rainforest along a shoreline or somewhere where there's a large river. And since orange dragons have a swim speed inherited from their yellow progenitors, they can make great use of watery terrain. And they can create massive explosions, which is also nice. But a biodiverse location rich in resources such as a rainforest or jungle is not without its competition. And the only thing that can really compete with a dragon is another dragon. There are two species of dragons that orange dragons often find themselves at odds with. Black dragons, for one, also favor damp and humid locations. Though black dragons usually tend towards swamps and mires, a rainforest can easily house such location and other areas a black dragon might find suitable. When one of our orange friends here and a black dragon find themselves competing for territory, things don't often go well for the black dragon. Orange dragons are larger, stronger, and deadlier than the malevolent black dragons could ever hope to be, so there are usually three possible outcomes here. In some cases, the black dragon will simply move on if there's another location nearby that it can call its own. But if that isn't an option, the black dragon often reluctantly becomes subordinate to the orange dragon in a pseudo one-sided partnership. However, in the possible event that the black dragon is much older than the orange dragon and therefore more powerful, the orange dragon is most definitely gonna get killed. Because from the black dragon's point of view, that's just a threat they won't have to deal with down the road. So I guess the takeaway here is that while any dragon is pretty scary, some dragons are scarier than others. The other type of dragon that often clashes with the orange dragon is the bronze dragon. Bronze dragons are known to inhabit areas on coastlines near the sea, and they are on much more even footing when we compare power levels. Also, as metallic dragons, they are almost never going to be willing to work with the orange dragons in their schemes. So what typically manifests here is a bitter rivalry. If one of the two dragons is older or more powerful for some reason, this is usually gonna result in the death of the other. But when the two dragons are evenly matched, what follows is usually a long running battle of wits with the two dragons trying to outsmart each other and gain some kind of advantage. What that specific advantage might look like really depends on the circumstances, but you can rest assured the orange dragon will stop at nothing to secure its dominance. Speaking of securing dominance, Let's talk about how this dragon actually fights. As I briefly touched on, orange dragons are extremely hard to predict. Their end goal is always to cause as much havoc as possible and ideally racking their enemies with fear in the process. Sometimes this means brazenly charging into battle, and other times 
it means being patient and waiting for the perfect moment to strike from ambush. They of course have access to all the typical sorts of moves a dragon does, such as their bite and claw attacks, as well as the frightful presence ability. But we're not here to talk about what they have in common with other dragons, we're here to talk about what makes the orange dragon unique. And for starters, that breath weapon. Who boy. As I said earlier, its ability to breathe sodium has a sort of delayed reaction. When it unleashes its breath weapon, anyone in the line of fire has to make a dexterity saving throw. Unlike most other breath weapons, if you pass the saving throw, you're fine. Nothing happens. However, if you fail the save, you are, of course, coated in sodium. Then, at the start of the orange dragon's next turn, anyone who has been coated in sodium bursts into flames and takes a bunch of damage. This is really interesting for a lot of different reasons. For one, during the round of initiative after the orange dragon has used its breath, the party knows who is and isn't at risk of taking a bunch of damage as they burst into flames. So they might do something to try and prevent that from happening. Assuming that they don't know this slime which has been breathed all over them is actually sodium, they might think to themselves, we can just wash it off before it ignites. But as we've already discussed, when you throw water on someone or something covered in sodium, and if someone covered in sodium slime explodes due to water exposure, not only do they take a ton of damage, but so does everyone else in their immediate vicinity. Also, with all the water that's bound to be nearby a tropical orange dragon's lair, a clever hero might think to jump in the water to cleanse themselves of the goop. And you can probably picture what happens if they try to do that. <laughs> However, despite all this, there is something they can do. While researching this video, I discovered that you can just buy small quantities of sodium on Amazon. That might seem really dangerous given everything we just talked about, but they ship it in bottles that are filled with mineral oil. By coating the sodium in oil, you prevent it from contacting the air and thus make it relatively safe to handle. This is extremely useful information for any would-be dragon slayers, because if you are coated in the dragon sodium breath, simply dumping oil all over yourself will delay the violent reaction for a time. It might seem counterproductive at first thought to dump oil all over somebody that you're worried about catching fire, but this is exactly the sort of thing an adventuring party might discover while investigating ways to take down an orange dragon. So while targeting a group of enemies with its sodium breath is a powerful move, it's not always going to be the dragon's first choice of target. Depending on the terrain, if the dragon has a chance to target a pool of water or an area that is very, very wet, as long as its enemies are surrounding that area, it's actually the best bang for your buck no pun intended. This is simply because any area of water hit by their breath weapon is going to explode and damage everyone around it. Bonus points if the dragon can hit a square with a person in it and another square that has water in it with the same attack. So depending on where this draconic battle is taking place, this explosive property could be a huge problem or a complete non-issue. But I guess that brings us to our next segment. So let's talk a little bit more about the kind of environments that the orange dragon is most likely to make its home. Not that dragons always have to be particularly stealthy, but it's a huge bummer when you're a predator born with scales that basically scream, hey, I'm over here. Like, there's a reason why anyone who works in a profession near dangerous equipment and moving machinery wears a bright orange reflective vest. It makes them extremely easy to see, and while that might be great for the guys walking in a flight that just landed at the airport, it's objectively awful for a hungry dragon trying to hunt. They do have enough raw speed and power to overcome this weakness for the most part, 
But that doesn't mean they're still not gonna try and pick the most optimal environment for their nest. A dense rainforest or jungle, ideally on the coast, is literally the best option that an orange dragon could hope for. Having lots of water around is great for obvious reasons, and a place where the foliage is so dense and potentially brightly colored is the best chance that this dragon's ever gonna have at blending in. But while many orange dragons may inhabit the jungles of the world, only the most ancient and legendary great worms among them actually alter the landscape just by their very presence. There are a few major tells that you're in the territory of an ancient orange dragon. First of all, water sources within a mile of their lair tend to be supernaturally warm and kind of salty. Also, within six miles of the dragon's lair, the flora tends to grow completely out of control to tremendous sizes, sometimes up to 10 times larger than their normal size. And this rampant growth is especially true of brightly colored flowers. Lastly, within that six mile radius, the undergrowth is also bestowed with some kind of facsimile of life. This causes a huge rise in the population of shambling mounds, blights, and even malevolent shrents to patrol the landscape. These effects only last as long as the dragon is alive. And if anyone wants to make that dragon unalive, they've got their work cut out for them. Actually finding an orange dragon's lair can be really tough. They tend towards caves that are only accessible by traveling underwater. And if you do manage to actually find the lair, you have a huge challenge waiting ahead of you. Especially if the dragon decides to cave in the whole place and starts breathing its sodium breath. You know, until this exact moment, I never really considered how that would work underwater, but basically it would just be breathing a line of explosions, which is crazy. I'm adding a mental note right now to add an underwater orange dragon encounter to the next game that I DM. <laughs> but there are a lot of ways that an orange dragon might appear in a game aside from just chilling in its lair. So let's take a moment and talk about a few. There is a lot of potential to unpack in the orange dragon's personality. For one, the potential relationship they have with both black and bronze dragons is something that can add a lot to an orange dragon encounter. Maybe the party is working with a bronze dragon NPC to help them in their struggle against this orange dragon. Perhaps the orange dragon is threatening to overtake the jungle and destroy many of the towns and villages that might be in the area. If you happen to be adventuring in Chult, for example, an orange dragon in the jungle is a huge threat that cannot be left unchecked. So whether the party's actively working with a bronze dragon or not, they might have to take on many of the dragon's minions and even potential cultists in order to eventually take on the dragon itself. Perhaps the party even works with a traditionally villainous black dragon in order to take down the greater threat. The black dragon might even agree to leave the party and their hometown alone if they're willing to help it destroy the orange dragon that they've been forced to work under. I also love the idea of an ancient orange dragon just choosing a new jungle to make its home and all of the people who live in the surrounding area are starting to notice the effects of its presence. As the plant life in the surrounding area starts to become more and more sentient and more and more hostile, eventually they decide that they have to send somebody to investigate what's going on. Enter your adventuring party. Even if they're not prepared to fight the ancient dragon, which, let's be honest, not many people are, they still might be able to convince the dragon to leave in exchange for something. So I'm gonna pay you $100 to fuck off. What that something is, is up to you. It could send them on another quest to do something morally questionable, or it could demand some kind of treasure or tribute, or who knows. But actually finding the dragon and solving that problem very well could just be the catalyst that leads into the next quest on the adventure. As I may or may not have mentioned in the other dragon videos, including these guys in a Horde of the Dragon Queen or Tyranny of Dragons campaign, something like that, 
could really throw some things on their head. Because not only is the orange dragon attached to all of this lore about Tiamat's murdered sister, again, something we all know about because we all watched the yellow dragon video, they're just not a type of dragon that most players playing 5th edition have been exposed to. So anytime you introduce a foreign element like that, people are gonna kind of take a step back and go, wait, <laughs> sorry, what kind of dragon? It's breathing what? I'm on fire and exploding? You know, cool questions every adventurer wants to ask their DM. But however you choose to use this monster, as always linked in the description down below is a Google document that contains all the stats and lore and information and layer actions and regional effects and all that good stuff for the orange dragon and each one of its age categories. So if you aren't playing AD&D, but you are playing fifth edition, you can find all that information down there and bring them to your game table. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, of course, over on the Patreon page, you'll be able to find the Monster of the Week style Dungeon Dad 5th edition PDF with all that same information, but just presented in a bit of a fancier style with some cool D&D artwork attached to it and all that good stuff. Thank you so much to all my patrons. I appreciate you guys for supporting what I do. And that also reminds me that it is time for Patron of the Week. This week's randomly selected patron is David. Thank you so much for the support, David. You are a Goliath of a patron. And thank you for watching. It truly means the world to me, and I hope that this holiday season you're ending off 2022 by doing something that makes you happy. I also want to take this time to give a little update on what was supposed to be last week's video. As a lot of you probably already know from my posts on Patreon and Discord, last week was supposed to be the debut of my video on the Spirit Warrior from Spelljammer. However, at like literally the last minute before I was getting ready to finalize everything, I managed to secure an interview with the monster's original creator. This will be the first time I've had a chance to interview someone on the show about a monster that they actually made, like, over 30 years ago, which is extremely exciting to me and I think it's going to make for a really awesome addition to the video. But unfortunately, due to some scheduling stuff, we weren't able to actually get the interview together until January. So even though the video is like 90% done, I wanted to wait until we do this interview because honestly, I just want the video to be the best that it possibly can be. So I do apologize for leaving you hanging without an upload for a couple weeks, but I promise it will be worth the wait. It's definitely the most ambitious I've ever gotten with the video I've made, so I'm really excited to show you guys the final product. So hopefully going into 2023, the Spirit Warrior will be one of, if not the first video I have to bring to you. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed this one, and if you did, please consider leaving a like or a comment. That stuff helps me out a bunch more than I can even explain. And if you're new here, this is your first time, please consider hitting that subscribe button as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. But all that aside, once again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. If there's a monster from an older version of D&D or some other tabletop system you would like to see on Monster of the Week, leave a comment, tell me about it, let me know in the monster suggestion discord channel that we have which is linked down there somewhere whatever your chosen medium of notifying me of this monster's existence is and i will take a look at it add it to the list and who knows you might just see it on an episode of monster of the week i'll see you in the next one until then